if they go through the process of separating soul and spirit and their soul is surrendered and their spirit and soul are functioning as intended in dual realms so that you're living in the realms of heaven spiritually with your spirit but your soul is dwelling here and sometimes you interact and engage both ways then if when you're doing that and you're flowing in that um a lot of people don't even need to know what they're where they're seated or what they're doing particularly unless they need to know in regards to what gets outworked on earth a lot of people would then you know i spent years learning how to do all the heavenly stuff so that i could teach other people and then i discovered well i i'm doing all of this now multi-dimensionally without having to think about it and do it cognitively every day which is how it was intended to be back so, to the basic questions okay so i was reading um your book on engaging sonship mm -hmm. i can't remember what it's there yeah. and it talked about interacting or engaging god in the physical realm in your inside internally in the spiritual in the heavenly realm mm. but i'm like really i find it hard to differentiate between them like i can mm. i know engaging within me but i when i try and engage in the heavenly realm it still seems pretty much the same as engaging internally so i assume that's just something that takes time to practice um yeah i mean it, it's the actual way you do it is exactly the same and the experiences that you have are basically the same it's just the places you have them are different so the heavenly realms yeah. are different from your internal garden or first love gate because they're the heavenly realms so there's you know you can still engage some things in both like the river of life will flow out of heaven and flow into you and into your garden and you can engage that river there um but the the heavenly realms where you are seated where you're learning to be in a position of authority is a governmental position that comes out of the intimacy of your relationship internally and also there's intimacy in in the father with the father in heaven or the father's throne you know the throne of grace that's a sort of intimate place but there's also governmental places like the throne room and things where the the perspective of it shifts and when i was experiencing this initially i did this in parallel it's hard to teach it in parallel obviously because you're sort of you, you can't really jump from one to the other you've got to say well here's here's this pathway of relationship in which you develop this relationship inside but you don't have to wait until that is all finished to engage the pathway of responsibility in sonship. So sonship carries with it, obviously, the relationship with the father. And that is the sort of intimacy that reveals our identity in sonship. Then the sonship also has the position of sonship, the authority of being the son of God, of being a co-heir and a co-creator with god and i found that what happened with me is the relationship i engaged with god within initially was by him opening that and drawing me to that <clears throat> and then i also started to present myself as a living sacrifice so i felt okay there's things in my life that need to be transformed how do i see that transformation take place i felt there's no, i'm not going to do this myself because that would be self-defeating if i was going to try and change myself well what would i change myself into um now in a sense what got revealed was as i knew more of god internally god began to reveal more of who i was and that then encouraged me to surrender that so i would every day i would present myself as a living sacrifice and then jesus took me through the process which was a symbolic process of he's my high priest 
he prepares the sacrifice. So I don't have to um, think, oh, what do I need to change my mind? What do I need to change my heart? What do I have to do to change what I'm doing every day? I just have to follow him and allow him to do those things. And he he did. And what the process he took me through was symbolically, and, and a lot of things are symbolic, that give meaning to something that in, gives you a grid of reference. So the living sacrifice process, if a, what does the high priest do to prepare the sacrifice? You know, it's that you've got a lamb on an altar. Mm -hmm. You don't just burn it. You know, they prepared it. So they chopped off its head. You know, first slit its throat to kill it. You know, this is pretty gruesome stuff, but, you know, but it's symbolic. It's not supposed to be, but it is supposed to be death. You know, I have died with him. So I'm entering into the death that I've died. So that's the symbolism of basically it's dead. You know, the sacrifice in the real sacrifice is dead, but a living sacrifice is not dead, but symbolically dies to self. Right. So literally i went through the process of okay i'm dying i'm dead to self not that i'm trying to kill myself or that i am you know i am entering into what is already true i died with him i've just not caught up with what that means so the renewing of my mind is the process that transforms me into what that already means that i died with him therefore i'm alive with him and he lives in me you know, it's no longer I who live on my own, you know, the sort of Galatians 3.20, where, you know, I'm, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in this body, I'm living through the faith of the Son of God. So it's all very different in terms of the self that was in control and in charge. And for most of us, you know, which is the sort of soul. So I'm surrendering my soul and the aspects of the soul that went along with it. So my head, my thinking, you know, so I'm dead in a sense, figuratively. So my thinking is no longer going to be attached to the dead part of me, the part of me that was in control, which meant he had to take me through the process of renewing my mind, deconstructing those old beliefs into the truth then they then split open the carcass with no head they split it open and took out all of the in innards so there was nothing hidden everything was exposed well symbolically that's what i was basically open to god show me search my heart oh god and try me you know, see if there's anything in me that's not in alignment with my true identity in you and therefore that's what i would engage and therefore he wanted to show me my heart he showed me things that were in my heart things which were hurts pains brokenness damage memories in my heart and then the the other two parts of it was they chopped off the the legs and for us symbolically we've only got two legs they had four legs so i saw it as well my hands so what i am doing I surrender what I'm doing to only do what I see you doing. And that was uh, uh, something that was my deliberate surrendering of what I do to only do what I see you doing. So I don't want to do my own thing. And I would say every day, I want no free will. I don't want to do my will. I don't want my will. So I want to know your will. I want to know, you know, and then the legs are symbolic to, well, where are we going? What do we do? Where are we walking? What places are we in? You know, and therefore I, I, that was the process for me that I initially went through when I engaged the heavens. You know, it wasn't all of the other stuff that eventually I entered into, although I had experiences of some things initially. When I then started to engage daily, I was going through Jesus as the door and entering in and surrendering 
as a living sacrifice. Um, and I went through that process and he took me through the tabernacle in heaven, which the earthly tabernacle was patterned after. So there has always been one which represents us, spirit, soul, body, if you like. The three part mm -hmm. tabernacle of man, you know, and ultimately. I didn't know all this then, particularly, I just was going through the experiences, but the earthly tabernacle had various things in it. You know, you had an, an outer court and an inner court and and holy holies, which is representative of body, soul, spirit. Um, and as I was engaging, then you have things like the laver, which is the water that they had to wash themselves before they went in any further. So that meant my body and the things that my physical body had been engaged in or was I wanted to surrender and I wanted to be clean and cleansed and symbolically, you know, this isn't, you know, it's it's the picture of the process that of transformation that I was going through. And then I went into the inner core, you know, and then there are things in there, the, the table with the showbread and the, the menorah and other things. And I engaged with the seven spirits of God there and I would engage with sort of things there figuratively as I went through this process. And eventually I went into the Holy of Holies and engaged the ark of God's presence there, which then took it to a whole different level. But I went through a process to get there. You know, so the living sacrifice process was I I am surrendering to only do what I see you doing. Now I want to see what you're doing. So I open your heart to me to know what you're doing. Now that for me was, well, what am I supposed to do then? Yeah, you know, at that point in my life, it was like, okay, well, what's my mandate? Yeah, you know, what are you calling me to do today? What what how can I unfold your heart so I know what you're doing? Um, and I engage with the ark. And initially, in my experiences with the ark, it was what was in the ark. And figuratively, again, there were three things in the literal ark, which were patterned after the heavenly ark. Therefore, you had the um, tablets, which were, let's say, what God writes on my heart, because he doesn't write on tablets of stone anymore. He writes his heart onto my heart or I resonate with him. There's all sorts of terminology. I didn't use the term resonate then. I just used the story as he's writing something on the tablets of my heart, which will give me guidance or direction or wisdom or insight, whatever it might be. And then there were uh, the manna, which came out of heaven, which represented God's provision. So I'm not doing this in my own strength. I'm doing this in his strength. So I'm receiving the flow of life that comes from him. So I'm drinking from the source, which is heavenly. And then you had Aaron's rod that buddied, which is symbolic of the authority I have now to outwork the father's heart um, in that way. And that's, I went on for a while like that. And every day I would sort of, okay, God, what are we doing? You know, I want to engage your heart. So I surrender as a living sacrifice, prepare me for today. And I would see it as, hey, I need, I want to be prepared for whatever comes today that's outworking your heart. And then after a while, the father stopped me doing that because I was focusing on what is it we're going to be doing and what do you want me to do rather than our relationship and the intimacy of it. So I would open my first love gate for the internal experience. And then I would be like, okay, what are we going to do? I'm going to go and engage as a living sacrifice now. And then one day the father just hugged me and didn't let me go. You know, and I'm sort of like, well, wh what are we going to do? You know, wh why can't you let me go? Let me go. You know, and it was like he didn't for, for months and months. Because he brought me back to everything that you're doing, which is good has to have a deeper foundation of relationship if it's going to be an expression of my heart. Otherwise, you will be expressing my heart through the filters of your heart, which will be twisted, usually, because we see things through our own filters, our own understanding, experience, and everything else. So God was showing me, 
you can't do this in your own understanding. You need to know me deeper and you need to know yourself in a way which you're never going to get just by doing stuff. So then as he did that, then I went back to that process of surrendering myself as a living sacrifice. And it was a totally different dynamic because I I began to understand God and God's love and his desire for me to enter into relationship with him and everything else um, in a way that I hadn't done before. Um, and so now it was more orientated towards love. Yeah. But eventually I, I went into the Holy of Holies again. I was not focused on what was in the ark. I was looking at the ark and I saw that there was a position for me to make a connection there with the presence of God that focused on what was manifesting between the wings of the cherub. When I took my place there and I started to see the four faces of God, the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. And I was drawn to the eagle always to start with. You know, and these things were evolving. I just could see the eagle and like, and then I would begin to engage with the eagle. And that's all I can say. It's difficult to define, but I knew it was to do with me in my authority thing as, as a son of God. But I was still directing what I was drawn to because there was still stuff in me that was drawn to this is what I do. It was who I am in terms of legislating governmentally. But what happened was I was drawn to the eagle and engaged the eagle, then the then the lion and then the ox and eventually the man. And I was sort of not drawn to the man at all because I had a prejudiced view of priesthood in, in a pastoral sense. And I sort of initially, when I first engaged the four faces of God and those things, that was back before I even went into heaven. And I sort of had a revelation of, well, this is God and this works out in this way, which then when I engaged it firsthand, sort of, I guess, filtered it. So I didn't want to engage the man because I, I didn't see myself in that role. Whereas I did see myself in the other roles, but I, not that role. But eventually when I did engage the man and I realized that actually the priesthood role is what actually empowers all the other roles as a royal priesthood and an oracle and a legislator. Then from that perce perception, I then began to enter into being able to stand in the four faces of God and stand in the name of God, in, in the power of his attorney as a son. And then from that place, be able to see through the eyes of the man and the lion and the ox and the eagle. And therefore I could see the world differently. So all of that was a process that also went along with, I'm seated on a throne on a mountain. And I have various other mountains that are symbolic of the spheres of authority I have in my life. So there are parallel experiences that happened, you know, a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this every day, you know, um, and so that's what went on. So my experiences within the realms of heaven came out of my experiences internally with God and development of that relationship within and then took me into more of my position seated in heaven and the authority I have as a son to outwork the father's heart. Um, and then all sorts of other stuff opened up after that, as I went through more and more process of transformation and engaged with wisdom and the you know, seven spirits of God and other things that happened to me. So, you know, the encounters within were with father, son and spirit. There were no no other beings there because I, I don't want any other beings operating in me. Um, and some people say, oh, well, I, you know, I have angels operating and um, I don't. And I don't want to, thank you. It's like, no, this is a place of intimacy for me and God. There's no room for anyone else in there in a spiritual sense of dynamic. Now, I make room for people there, 
and relationships there that I carry in my heart. But it isn't like, oh, I've got this spirit guide or and I think it gets a little bit weird when people say, well, you know, I, I you know, have Abraham operating in me and things like that. I'm like, do you? That that is to me that that isn't how it works. But I can engage with Abraham in the realms of heaven in in the, you know, different places of heaven that you can engage the, the seven spirits of God and you can engage the living creatures and you can engage the angelic realm and you can engage with a cloud of witnesses and all of that and that's the difference there's the positions that and the encounters you have are different from the internal because they carry a different perspective uh you know and i learned that and understood that over a, quite a long period of time you know to which when i started i didn't have any idea what was going on you know, I just carried on engaging and following my nose, sort of like, well, where is it going? Where's the father off to? I'm going to follow him sort of thing. Um, but God was orchestrating it all because I'd surrendered as a living sacrifice. He was able to orchestrate that journey for me. Because I was willing to follow him. You know, and there were some corrections along the way that he did, and there were processes of change and cycles of change. So all the experiences I had in that realm were designed to equip me in sonship, understanding my position of authority there, where I'm seated, the different levels of government I had as I matured, all of that. So it's, it is different, but it starts for me internally in developing a relationship with god that reveals who i am and then shows me my position and my authority within that realm um, and if you try and operate in that realm without being surrendered you end up doing things in your own strength in your own way which is never going to be you know successful um so there's always going to be a if I want to go into a position of government, I can't do it other than going as a sacrifice. If I do it and try and do it, then I'm going to be you know, messing it up. You know. But everyone's journey will be different. So the, your experiences of that may be different from mine. But the end result is that you will find where you're seated and where you have authority and when you can outwork that authority in alignment with the Father's heart. Yeah. You know um now you say well you know they, they seem to be similar well encounters are encounters so yeah there's a similarity in what happens within your thinking or within your emotions or within what you're experiencing but what happens in that realm for me because of the nature that God has wired me and connected me and because what he called me to do, I had these parallel tracks that were going on for the few first few years that other people might not do it that way. You may focus mostly internally and not really engage that stuff till later until God gives you this thing of, hey, you know me enough now to know this stuff is going to be easier for you. For me, it wasn't that easy because I was sort of not knowing what was going on and what was happening and where I was going and all these things. It didn't make, you know, I didn't have it logically worked out. They were just encounters that were happening. It was later looking back, you can see, okay, I understand these, these parallel things I was engaging with now so that I could be able to explain them from having had a sort of a rounded view of it when i went to teach it i taught the pathway of relationship you know and people were always on at me about the legislative side of it well when are we going to do legislation or when are we going to know what we're going to do because they were sort of again works driven really they wanted to know what they could do because they weren't sort of satisfied with the intimacy because we're all sort of that way inclined because of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a works based system you get your identity from what you do and therefore you know, i was having to hold people back and said well actually if you try and do this now you're going to be out of sync 
with the development of your relationship with God, which empowers all of that. But eventually I sort of did do a legislation model module, um, which was not really in in what I wanted to do, but I, I thought, well, I'm going to have to do something to give people some idea because they're going to try and do it themselves anyway because they'll be hearing it out here from this person and that person and then they're going to go and try and do it and they'll get into trouble if they don't have some basic framework of how you rule and how you are enthroned and what you do from a throne and how you manage the government of that and how you legislate using authority and all of that so i eventually did do a module which was a basic legislative module which then later on I went into much more depth into, into the different aspects of it in a different way, you know. So you know, don't don't worry about it or be concerned about it. If you set your heart on, okay, I'm going to present myself as a living sacrifice, and then we'll see what God does, because it's up to Him what He wants to do. You know, we don't have to set the agenda. We don't have to force or drive the, the agenda. We just have to surrender. So it's like, okay, God, I'm a living sacrifice. If I need preparation, over to you. You do what you need to do. I'll cooperate with you. But the relationship of intimacy and developing sort of your wholeness within will be so beneficial later as you engage in more of the heavenly realm stuff you know uh, and for some people if they go through the process of separating soul and spirit and their soul is surrendered and their spirit and soul are functioning as intended in dual realms so that you're living in the realms of heaven spiritually with your spirit but your soul is dwelling here and sometimes you interact and engage both ways then if when you're doing that and you're flowing in that um a lot of people don't even need to know what they're where they're seated or what they're doing particularly unless they need to know in regards to what gets outworked on earth a lot of people would then, you know, I spent years learning how to do all the heavenly stuff so that I could teach other people. And then I discovered, well, I, I'm i doing all of this now multidimensionally without having to think about it and do it cognitively every day, which is how it was intended to be. We're you know, intended to be out working heaven on earth through us not spending all our time in heaven trying to do it yeah therefore you're enjoying life and expressing heaven on earth and and the life of god on earth and allowing you know what doing what god is showing us to do and all of that on earth as it is in heaven but we don't have to be doing it all the time you know if i was doing everything i'm doing in heaven right now linearly it would take me a week every day just to do one beer but i'm i'm we're designed to be able to do multiple things at multiple times in multiple places so that that can manifest on earth and we live in peace and rest you know i couldn't say i was living in rest while i was learning to do all the stuff because it was a law and i was having to try and understand and all this and everything else and yeah and i know you know god took me through that because you know, of the nature of what he wanted me to do with the engaging God program and everything else. So I, I needed to understand, to be able to give a framework for what all this means. But ultimately, when you get to the end of it all, you've come into a state of being rather than I've got to do this and I've got to do this today, I've got to do that today, I've got to do this today, then, then I've got to do this. And then, then maybe then that will be outworked on earth. You know, well, no, I can dwell and abide in that being so that everything flows here in a seamless way you know um, so maybe you'll be fortunate enough not to have to go through learning how to do it all you can just embrace what it is that you will be doing and just enjoy being you know because ultimately that's the end goal and if you can embrace the end goal and end up coming into that state of being 
then you will be seated and you will be functioning and your spirit will be operating there even if you don't cognitively know all the time what it is that's happening but a lot of people want to know and i think that's part of still the need to know burst out of well i'm secure when i know what's going on rather than i had to get to the point where i trust you god even if i don't know what's going on and that was the foundation to a state of being if i still needed to know what was going on i would be trying to engage in multiple places doing multiple things and i would have no time left for anything else you know so i don't need to know and i surrendered my need to know as part of the process i didn't need to know and i trusted god even if i didn't know and that then eventually brought me to a place where i don't need to know anything i just need to be you know and that will be an outworking of who i am in a heavenly realm perspective and an internal perspective in me being whole and one and unified you know in union spirit soul body rather than well my spirit's doing this my soul's doing that my body's doing this and they're all sort of interacting but you know separately no i'm in union so i don't think of spirit soul body as separate parts of me i'm just me i'm me here i'm me there i'm me wherever i am you know and that's life you know um so don't don't sort of strive for something you know just keep fl flowing with it you know and if your heart is well i am going to present myself this way my desire is that i would um, be able to know the father's heart and then be able to outwork the father's heart then you know that that's all we really need um but i you know i'm aware that for some people people are called to different things so if you're called to a heavenly function which is legislative and is producing and outworking laws for heaven to manifest on earth then you're going to spend more time doing that for some people that isn't what they're called to do they're called to spend most of their functioning time on earth outworking what's already going on in heaven but we're all different and therefore we've got to sort of discover who we are and where we're positioned along the way so that then we can just be content with all that um and therefore you know you can't put a pattern down for everyone and say well this is this is it becomes a formula everyone's journey is different because everyone's destiny is different you know finding it and fulfilling it will bring fulfillment to you which wouldn't fulfill me because i'd be doing something that isn't really me and that's what a lot of people try and do people try and do what they see someone else doing you know which which ends up with frustration because they can never do it like someone else can do it because they're not them and therefore they're missing out on what they're ha and outworking of who they are and being at peace and rest with that whatever it might be yeah and that that for some they want to be seated on the galactic council somewhere but i think that is because there's still ego there and the need for a position to validate themselves you know and it's more likely you'd end up on the council of 70 in heaven if you didn't want to or didn't need to and those who do need to and do want to probably need to look at why they need to and why they want to because probably there's still stuff there which is motivating them with the idea of a higher position the need for a higher position to in some way give them some sort of self-worth and self-esteem whereas you know i got to a point where i was engaging with the council of 70 um and i remember the father sort of saying you know there's a place for you here and i'm like oh i don't want it thank you <laughs> it's like no thanks yeah if someone else could do that yeah uh, and, and i meant it because it was like why would i want to do that because at that point i didn't need any form of self-validation from a position 
you know, I was quite happy with, you know, who I was in that sense without the need of any form of position. And then I started actually to give away all the positions that I held in terms of physical positions. You know, I stopped church leadership and I withdrew from various things because it was like, I don't need this. You know, this, this actually isn't something now I realize I fulfilled a role because other people didn't fulfill a role or couldn't fulfill a role and I fulfilled a role really wasn't me you know and you know when it came to leadership and I did redemptive gift surveys and things leadership or ruling was number three on my list after a prophet teacher because I had to learn how to do it so I knew how to do it and I could do it but I, I didn't like doing it I didn't want a position I didn't want a leadership role I hated being up front and doing the orchestrating of a meeting or something oh didn't like i really don't like that because i'm not really a upfront type of person people will probably think i am but actually i'm quite shy in personality type i'm quite happy you know on my own in a sense um and therefore you know i have a, I had a friend and he 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 really didn't want anything to do with leadership, but give him like the MC of a meeting or of a wedding or something like that. And he just like he had this persona that he was and he was like brilliant at it. And if I had to do that, I'd be like, I, don't, I would never do it because I would just it, I would feel so out of place and so awkward because it's not me. But I had to sort of you come to the realization of some of that is oh am i not doing it because i'm broken and i'm afraid of not doing it because i don't want to make a fool of myself or whatever or is it just not me and i really started to realize there are certain things weren't me and i found it quite easy to say oh, no, i'm not going to do that anymore and letting all that go you know because i was more secure in really living in a state of being which was very different from what i was doing in leading church and planting churches and doing all that stuff which is very works orientated even if it's doing the things that god wants you to do there's a lot of stuff you have to do you know and i never took a title because that was never me i never wanted a title but people always want to give you one you know and it's like you know well i don't respond to titles you know, I remember someone saying, well, what do we call you? Well, call me Mike. That's my name. You know, I don't need, I don't need you to call me Pastor Mike because it'd be like, I'll be throwing up if you keep doing that. You know, because it's just like, that's not me. You know, so there's a sense where you get secure in who you are and then you're free from the need to perform and the need to actually fulfill other people's expectations of you. Because I found I could say no. People didn't like it, but I could say no. I, I, that's not. I don't. I don't want to do that. Thank you. I don't need to do that, and I don't feel that's what God wants me to do. So I'm not going to do it. You know, and for that, people str people struggle with that when you're in a position that they expect you to do this and this and this. And I'm like, no, that's not me. So I'm not going to do it. Yeah, you know? and I wasn't being obtuse or trying to be awkward. I just got to a point where if I keep doing that, someone else is not going to do it. Who should be doing it? You know, so I'm actually a cork in a bottle. If I'm actually doing the roles that are blocking other people from being who they are. You know, and, and I'm quite a capable person. So, you know, I'm, I could do all the roles. I have done all the roles, you know, church wise from cleaning the toilets to preaching at the front and doing all the other stuff yeah you know, um but you you know you're fulfilling other people's expectations which means they are sitting there watching you do stuff that they are actually called to do you know and i began to encourage others to take their positions rather than me doing it yeah. so anyway it's a long sort of answer to the question but there's a there's a lot to that side of things which you know you don't want to rush
um and you may ne may never even need to to actually be aware of most of it because it's a spiritual function mostly um i've been exactly the same as joanna really just um doing the regular engaging god and everything and feeling like i'm not getting anywhere but i know it's spiritual so i don't have to feel anything or see anything because it's a spiritual thing so with me like um i'm actually feeling a bit uh guilty of even having fear because of my pain mm. and um what's going on in my body there's lots of things happening that have been happening within the last few weeks that's really thrown me and um, right. so i have been really really struggling to the degree where I have to lie down to like now I'm fine at the minute um, but it's very hit and miss and it, I, I am in a lot of pain and I'm trying to deal with this and that so I feel a bit overwhelmed and I'm I keep seeing that that verse um uh this is the way I am at the minute rock asleep um just basically um, about fear. Uh, so what even, you, you're afraid, what, what's the fear based in? Um, the fear is of, because I've had compression fractures, mm -hmm. even sort of, um, it's basically the pain. Mm -hmm. It's basically the pain that frightens me more than anything. Um, Frightens you in that you feel there's that pain that you can't be able to do stuff or you, you're, you're limited? I'm frightened in case I'm going to get more fractures. Right, okay. Because I've got compression fractures. Yeah. And yeah. even today, I, you know, I was perfect love, Casa or fear. I've been saying that for like weeks, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, and I feel so guilty when I do feel fear, when there's a lot of fear being in me and a lot of anxiety. And um, I don't want to be like that because... This is this is fairly still. I'm still coming to terms with it, even though it was 23 when I was first diagnosed um, with osteoporosis, and I, mm. I, I, I don't want to come into agreement with even the name of it. But it, that's that's what's happened. Is what it's been. Yeah, I've been told it is, and fractures and everything, and I've been really trying to get into my meditation. I can't sit upright like. I'm looking at my bed. Uh, I have to lie down and I, I just know that God understands everything. And I yeah. just say to him, listen, Lord, you know, Mike, Mike says, um, if I um, just say something and, and, and not even believe it, it, I just, because we're spiritual beings, I am being proactive with you and I'm expecting um, that I'm going to be engaging with you Um in the spiritual realm, it doesn't matter what I don't, you know, but th there's always this verse that keeps popping up, perfect love, concept or fear. And um, I feel like I'm grumpy, mm. cranky, my husband, um, and stuff. And and he's, he's awesome. He's been so really, 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 uh, proactive with me yeah. and um, patient and everything but um, gosh I feel awful sometimes because I feel mm. grumpy and it's not it's not me yeah but he understands he gets a bit annoyed but he understands so I'm, I'm really struggling with that sort of but at the same time I've been sort of so clinging to God more if you understand what I'm saying because I've got nowhere else to go and I'm, I'm I'm trying not to sort of um be I feel like I'm begging him or anything but right. I'm trying to understand pain All right um, and, and and I know it's going to help other people because I've never felt, felt pain like this before and I know God's going to use it. Mm. I know he's going to use it for good. I mean, that sounds 
crazy. But that's the way I think, you know, I, I really yeah. have to think that way. Yeah. I know God I, didn't do this. And no. I, know, hmm. I think it it's it feels like that you're in some parts of you are in a place of rest and parts of you aren't. And therefore there is this sort of tension between that which you are at rest in and that which you aren't. And ultimately, you know, being at rest is you're not carrying any burdens or any uh, uh, responsibilities that you feel you have to fit. You know, Jesus said, you know, if you're weary and heavy laden, so if you're tired, what are you tired of? that you're not in rest so that might be fighting what you're fighting or trying to overcome what you're trying to overcome and and a lot of that is it's not that we don't take a position of well i am not accepting this but we don't fight it or try and overcome it or mm -hmm. try it you know it because that becomes wearying and then Did you, you do get right yeah it's like okay i accept this is not the best that God has for me. And I know this isn't God's will for me that I would be in this situation, but I've got to live in this situation as if I wasn't in this situation so that this situation will change. And a lot of people try and change the situation and that is their focus. I, I need to be free of pain. I need to be free of this situation. I need to be healed. I need to be made whole. And their whole focus of life is focused on that. And when it doesn't happen, then they're frustrated or whatever. But actually, when you know God and know God's love in an unconditional sense, you are able to have no fear because you realize there is nothing that God is holding against you, even like some people will feel failures because they're still sick or they still got a problem. And subconsciously, they will think God, therefore, is looking lesser at them. And there's a complexity of the way we view ourselves, think about ourselves and think about how we would like God to view us that can sort of be very complex and be can be quite wearying. Whereas actually, if we know we're unconditionally loved, we don't have to do anything because we are unconditionally loved. Therefore, there is no fear because there's no doing. You know, so the fear of the pain is probably tied up with the fear of disapproval from God because you still got the pain and you haven't and you're still not overcoming it. And therefore, well, it, you know, deep down is well is there something i shouldn't be doing why am i not overcoming am i not good enough to overcome it this sort of it gets tied up with our identity and you're absolutely right not to identify with the condition but the condition is there so accepting the condition but accepting that in god you are whole and that the more you live in that relationship with him, the more wholeness will begin to get outworked in your life. And the weariness of having to try and maintain it or fight, or keep standing against it or keep, you know, all of that wears you out. But I've, Jesus never, said, Pray. I've never actually experienced God. Hmm. I haven't experienced the Father. And hmm. that's what I'm longing for. Okay. And you know, um, yeah, it, it, and I, I mean, I know he loves me. I know he loves me and I know I'm no different from anybody else. It's not that. It's just, I haven't, and I'm doing the med meditations and, 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 and that, and I know that something has to be going on in the spiritual realm. And that's what keeps yeah. me going because we're spirit. Yeah. More but he does want you he does want you to be whole spirit soul <laughs> and body therefore yeah. when one aspect of that is out of sync with the others you are not going to be in union and therefore there is going to be a disconnect and there, therefore mm -hmm. you know even if physically you're not completely physically healed you can still live in the position of being healed 
mm. in your soul and in your mind and in your thinking because mm. your physical body does not control how you feel and how you think no so and that comes from um knowing god loves you as you are and yeah. he's not holding anything against you in any way whether that be sort yeah. of where yeah. you are physically or the pain or anything else but also jesus said pray believe that you have received and you will receive so there's yeah, where we, in yeah. the reality of our healing and wholeness even if we're not there yet yeah that's a state of peace and rest mm -hmm. that we live in because we know god's goodness and god's love and god's desire for us is different from our present experience yeah yeah you know? and i and i would suggest you know when you engage with god and you meditate and don't put an agenda on it other than father i want to know you more you know you and, and that's just where you engage and what you receive as you engage and i think doing the exercises focuses our attention like yeah. opening the first love gate and welcoming god's the father's presence to hug you and embrace you is a thing what you experience everyone's experiences will be different because everyone is different but what you experience god wants you to know it so that you know that you know that you know whether you feel a sensation whether you feel an emotion whether there's an intuition of i feel peace or i feel god's arms around me or i feel love or whether i have a full-blown i am going to picture a door and open the door and see the father coming and i'm going to engage him you know all of that is valid you know but mm -hmm. one is not more valid than the other yeah. just tune in it's learning to tune in to that which you feel see for me god asked me a question once and said well how do you know that i love you you know and it's like and then it, then it was like followed up with well how do you feel that love mm. and i was sort of like okay that's a difficult question you might sound easy but actually it's like and therefore i went into well what is my language of love mm. you know and i and i felt i knew what my language of love was in relationship you know in the love languages type of thing and actually i was wrong my love language was determined by my lack of something and my need for something rather than actually what it was so mm -hmm. i thought it was physical affection because i mm -hmm. didn't have that so i was lacking it and i thought that to be loved having physical affection would make me feel loved but with god that's what i also thought oh it must be these intimate feelings and and then it was like yeah but i don't seem to have those intimate feelings like other people do you know the sort of goosebumps and the sort of you know warm and fuzzies that people get you know and it's like so i thought intimacy was all those warm and fuzzies and what god was trying to show me was your language of love isn't that so it was like okay how do you know i love you how do you feel my love well when we hang out mm -hmm. so just quality time whether i feel anything sense anything or anything just the fact that you're giving me quality time i mm. know you love me yeah and actually my actual love language mm. in you know in a, in a marriage relationship type love language is quality yeah. time yeah not physical touch yeah. although i you know like the physical cuddling stuff yeah. but it actually that's not it and i thought it was so i would encourage you to find what is your language of love how would you feel is it an emotion is it a sense of you know because all of us are different and if you think the languages of love the five languages of love just some people will sort of put another couple onto there but you know they are words of affirmation mm -hmm. quality time physical affection gifts 
um, and service. And mine's so, definitely quality, quality yeah. of time. I like so, one of them. So from that sense, then, if it's quality time, mm. then the quality time that you spend should fill your emotional tank mm. to which then how you feel that you'll be able to get a handle on because it might be a feeling it might be something else you know so well how do i how do i feel love when i say well let god love you some people will come back and say well what does that mean i don't know what that means to you know god's love is all over you what does it mean tangibly it will be different for everyone yeah some people it might be just this oh i just sink into this sort of stupor of just feeling loved for others mm. it could be an emotion that they actually feel excited or peaceful or rested whatever yeah you know, everyone's different and that's why it's so hard mm an activation about receiving love and unconditional love and people don't know what it is to receive it mm -hmm. so you're sort of trying to say okay well don't focus on what you're trying to receive just come to a place of meditation so that whatever you receive you're mm -hmm. not blocking by your own mind getting in the way trying to work out what it is that feeling love is you know and i've had a mm -hmm. few comments from people it's like feel feel the love of god you know over the top of you and going through you well what is it i'm supposed to feel i said well i don't know mm. what, what are you feeling? feeling you know what are you feeling what do you feel what 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 is going mm. on when you're in a place where you're meditating because that's what you what can develop so that that brings you to a place of for you what knowing it your love and feeling that your love because there are yeah, differences yeah. Yeah. you know you say well i know god loves me but you're also saying yeah. well i've not met the father so there's a there's a disconnect between what you know as true yeah and you're experiencing as true yeah. and god wants you to have both yeah if just for you what would it feel to meet the father how would you know oh my gosh um, yeah, I think that the thing I most say is, Lord, if I don't know you, I'm never going to know myself. Um, yeah. But that's a, that's a sort of an agenda. Is it? You wanna, yeah, you don't want to be going it's, into... It doesn't feel like an agenda. So I can know myself. It's in my heart. Yeah, but it, that's... It's, it's, all the all for everyone is, is the same. Mm. But what you don't want is to be thinking... Oh, if I don't, if I don't know God, I'm not going to know myself. It's a consequence of knowing God, not a motivation to know God. Mm. You know, so don't let yeah. that drive you. Just sort of, you know, you can say to God, look, you know, the pure in heart will see God. So if there's something in my heart, which is a mixture of motives or needs or desires or a lack of, then yeah. I surrender my heart to you so that you can purify my heart. Then I can see you, which means mm. to perceive and to know and to experience in a way which will be beyond what I'm doing right now. But mm. you've got to sort of almost like those thinking, well, I'm never going to know myself. And that's, that can therefore become a motivation. And that isn't what God is looking for. He, he mm. wants you just to know him purely for him. And to know you're loved purely for you and everything else will flow out of that. Yeah. But it's finding what that means for you. You know, I mean, how, when you meditate, can you picture something in your mind? Uh, yeah, I do the door. I see the door and I see Jesus on the other side yeah. and I invite him to come in. So and... you're engaging with Jesus like that, but not yeah. the Father. I do I do talk to the father as well though. I do, yeah, but, I do um, but, but you're saying you see Jesus, but you said you haven't seen the father. I haven't yeah, well, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah I so get what, it. Why? What what if you can see Jesus and this is like I mean most people can't see that. Yeah. So, you know, you're what you're you're a step ahead of most people. 
but actually jesus is the express image of the father so are you sure you're not actually seeing the father because the father looks just like jesus yeah There's i was no reading that in the book just today actually yeah um you no. And it's like, maybe you're just having an expectation that you're seeing Jesus, but actually Jesus is the full image of the father. And when I engage the father, it's not a difference between him and the, the appearance of Jesus and the father mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. But I know the difference because I've spent time with and I know the frequency of the, the father as opposed to the frequency of the son, although they don't look any different. So okay. maybe you've just not connected. But if you can see I'll Jesus that, and that. being that, then, hey, you know, that's a lot more than a lot of people do. I've got the photographs. I think I told you of them, the, um, yeah. it, uh, Anna, what do you call that? Not Annika. You know who I mean, though, the, yeah, the one in the red. Yeah, but I've got that picture. So I, I see, I see yeah. Jesus there like mm. that. Yeah. So I imagine him, yeah, and um, but and the I, father I, I, is I the see him coming through. I see him coming through the, hmm. the doorway, um, and sometimes I say, "Well, I'm going to go the other way," because I remember you said that to somebody recently. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm imagining hmm. I'm going both ways, really. Uh, and well, at that point, I see going into at the, the river. point where you're hmm. opening that door yeah set the desire of your heart on engaging the father at that point and ask the father father will you meet me here and if there's a reason why you're struggling with that ask him to show you what it is because for me that was father wounds you know i i had given my father and dealt with my father stuff i yeah, thought definitely but i still had wounds the scars of mm. it and the scar tissue was stopping me engaging with the father so wow. the father, when Jesus said, you've got father wounds, I was like, well, no, I don't. You know, I've dealt with those, you know, and then he showed me, well, there's all this scar tissue. So there's something still wow. there affecting the, your ability to engage the father. And I didn't until. And he said, do you want the father to heal that wound? To which I said, yes, I do. And the father came to me, just like Jesus coming to me. It wasn't any different, if, in, but it was the father. And he just said, I love you and I love you and I love you and love you. And the scar removed. And then that hindrance and obstacle that I didn't know I had was removed. And then I was able to engage the father in the same way I was able to engage Jesus or the Holy Spirit. There was There was no disconnect anymore, but there was something blocking it. So maybe just ask him to show you, is there something which is a hindrance? Because if you can see Jesus, you can see the Father. Mm. And that's the reason why you can't. Because mm. Jesus said to his disciples, well, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. Didn't he? In John 14. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Yeah. But is there a reason why you're not perceiving it to be the Father? Or there's some disconnect there? And I would just ask him to show you. You know, so there yeah. may be something which is a hindrance, subconsciously, yeah. which is just a blockage. Because you, I think, right there. Mm. You know, if you can see it's Jesus, you can see the Father, because they are, in a say, the same. Yeah. Different. Mm, thank you. That's really right. good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, nice seeing you. I'm going to leave it there. Nice seeing you. Have a good okay. rest of your day. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.